format of the seminars is uh, as usual, 60 minute presentations followed by 15 minute Q&A session. Uh, we request all attendees to keep your microphones muted and use the chat uh, facility to ask questions and we will monitor the chat. Uh, the talk is recorded. And uh, at the end of the talk, we have a Q&A session. You'll be able to ask questions um, uh, live as well. Before, before I hand over to Francisco, let me remind you that uh, next week we will have uh, Daniel Rappaport from Chicago talking about observational learning with ordered states with Navin uh, Kartik and Sungmok Lee. Um, guest panelist Manuel Muller-Frank. Um, okay, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. And Francisco, the mic is yours. Great, thank you so much, uh, Max, and the rest of the organizers for this opportunity. And thanks also to the guest panelists. Um, today, yeah, I'm gonna talk about the timing of complementary innovations. And let me start by saying that one of the main goals of innovation policy is to orient resources towards the projects, the research and development projects that have more value from a social point of view, like the vaccine now has a lot of value. So we want society to allocate a lot of resources to that uh, particular development. An issue is that sometimes the usefulness of an innovation may be tied to the uncertain outcome of other complementary development. Think for example, in the case of a diagnosis method and a treatment for the same medical condition, the diagnosis method and a novel diagnosis method is gonna be more valuable if there is a a treatment for that medical condition and vice versa. And another example that I use in the paper is the case of hardware and software in particular in the realm of quantum computers. Today we observe a, uh, a large set of companies that are investing in developing quantum software when there is no clear, um, there is no hardware that can run that, hope, uh, uh, that software now and it's not clear that it will ever uh, exist such a hardware. So these research and development projects carry high level of uncertainty in terms of both in terms of the outcomes, the projects may or may not prove to be successful, but also in terms of the cost. It's not um, known exactly how much time and resources will be required to succeed in these projects. However, this uncertainty is at least partially resolved as the projects are pursued. For example, some projects are successfully completed, but some other projects are found to be more challenging than what was originally expected. So with this in mind, the first question in this paper is, well, what is the efficient timing of development of complementary uncertain innovations? Is it efficient to start, for example, in the case of the treatment and the diagnosis method, start with the treatment and once you have that, move your resources to develop the diagnosis method or vice versa? Or maybe it's efficient to work on the treatment and diagnosis method simultaneously. Another important question is when one should stop the development of these um, complementary innovations. And this question of efficient timing of uh, complementary innovations is not only relevant for a social planner that wants to do things in a, in a way that is efficient, but also if you think of a single firm that is maximizing profits, well, this uh, efficient development of these innovations will be a necessary condition for, um, for profit maximization. However, in some industries, research and development is not carried out by a single central decision maker like a social planner or, um, or a single firm, but it's carried out in a decentralized way by multiple firms or individuals that have private incentives and that compete in the development of these innovations. So a second question that I try to answer in this paper is, well, when and how can the efficient development of these complementary innovations be implemented with decentralized incentives? So this decentralized uh, allocation of resources, I'm gonna focus on two potential inefficiencies that I can bring to the table. The first one is underdevelopment. And there is gonna be underdevelopment when there is imperfect appropriability of the rents from subsequent complementary innovations. So if you think of the value of one innovation, for example, the treatment for a, for a medical condition, this, um, this value we can split in two. On one side, there is some value that is added given the current technology level. But on the other side, this uh, new innovation increases the value of the remaining complementary projects. For example, developing a better diagnosis method. Now, if the firms cannot appropriate this increase in value of the remaining complementary projects, then they will not capture all the value of the innovation and therefore there could be under development 
um, and, and this is of course inefficient. But another uh, inefficiency is gonna be due to the inefficient timing of development. And this could happen if firms focus on easy innovations as a way to capture more rents from this uh, innovation process. And when in fact it was efficient to first develop the difficult innovation. So going back to the example of hardware and software, maybe it's efficient to wait until the hardware is developed to start developing software, but firms jump to the development of software um, early as a way to, to capture more rents uh, from the development of quantum computers and software. So what I do in this paper is first I introduce a dynamic model of research and development. Uh, and the key feature is that the development requires resources that are not project specific. You can think of these resources as time, money, attention, or any resource that is uh, not project specific. And as the projects are pursued, the, the prospects of the projects change stochastically. So I solve for the efficient allocation. You can think of this as the planner's problem. And this is a mood, already an interesting problem, even if it's a single agent problem, because it's a multidimensional experimentation problem with interrelated pay payoffs. And in particular, we cannot apply a general result such as a Gittins index uh, to guide the optimal allocation of resources. The reason we cannot apply a general result is when the agent works on one of the projects, this will reveal information about the viability of that specific project. But also, it will change the returns from succeeding in a complementary project. And this interrelationship in the, in the payoff is what uh, makes this not a standard multi arm bandit for which you can apply uh, a general result such as the Gittins index. What I show is that for complements, there is going to be an equivalence between this dynamic problem of allocation and a simpler recursive problem that allows me to, to, to find a solution. And then I consider a decentralized allocation. And this I'm going to do in a reduced form approach. I consider an allocation that always allocates the resources to the project with highest immediate expected reward. So remember that I said that the value of an innovation we can split in two. Well, this reward from the innovation will be able to capture all the value that is added given the current level of technology, but only a fraction alpha of the increasing value of the remaining projects. And this alpha, how much of the increasing value of the remaining projects can be captured by the firm that innovates is gonna be the policy variable, and, and I'm gonna call this the level of appropriability. So I'm gonna show simple conditions that determine the qualitative features of the efficient allocation, in particular, whether it's efficient to complete the projects in sequence, that is concentrate all your resources in one project and only move to the next one after you succeed in the first one. And when it's efficient to work on multiple projects simultaneously. And then I'm gonna show conditions under which it is possible to implement this efficient allocation with decentralized incentives. That means that there exists some alpha, some level of appropriability such that the decentralized allocation is efficient. Are there any questions so far? If not, okay, let me say how this paper relates to the literature. Of course, there is a large and important literature that studies complementary innovations. This is a very important question, of course. And what I think I add to this um, branch of the literature is that I study a, a model in which there is uh, dynamics in terms of the prospects of each uh, project. So when the agent works on a project, he learns, and this, this affects his beliefs about how costly it will be to complete that project. And at the same time, I have endogenous timing of development. So it's not like in the literature of sequential innovation in which there is an exogenous fixed order in which the innovation should happen. So here the agent can work on the hardware first and the software after or vice versa. Um, and then there is another more recent branch of the literature that is um, very much related and it's the literature on information acquisition from multiple sources. So like in um, my paper, in this, uh, in, this, um, in this paper, usually you have a single agent that decides how to allocate his uh, attention um, across different uh, sources of information. And therefore the dynamics are gonna be very similar to, to my problem where you have an agent that allocates uh, resources uh, to different uh, innovation projects. 
Um, the main difference is that this literature is sometimes considered substitutes or different attributes um, in, that, in the payoff of the agent is linear in these attributes. And I consider a complementarity in payoffs. And I'm going to be explicit about what, what I mean by this complementarity in payoff after I introduce the model. So let me jump now to the model. So there's going to be two projects that I'm going to call A and B. And time is going to be continuous. The agent's decision is going to be Basically, you can think of the agent's decision as having two parts. On one side, he has to decide when to stop the process of innovation. So it's going to be a stopping decision. And the other side, he has to decide how to allocate resources before stopping. So each instant before stopping, the agent allocates a unit of a resource that I'm going to call attention from now on across the two projects. So the attention that the agent allocates to project A at time t plus the age, uh, attention that the agent allocates to project B at time t has to be less equal to the total attention that the agent has at time t, which is uh, 1. A project is going to be completed when the cumulative attention that the agent puts to that project reaches a completion amount tau i. So tau i is the amount of cumulative attention that is required in order to complete that specific project. Now, project completion is going to be observable. So the agent is going to observe at each point in time which projects he already completed. So the projects for which the completion amount tau is less than the cumulative attention that was allocated. However, these completion amounts are going to be not observable, the agent is not going to observe this, and uh, but he's going to know the distribution from which these completion amounts were drawn. So, Francisco, so here yes. the ST, the set of mm -hmm. uh, projects have been, that have been completed. So then yep. this is uh, the subsets of A and B, right? So we, exactly. we start in mm -hmm. the empty set, then we can jump to either A or B, A or B, and then, and then we both have to go to A, B. Yeah. And yep. these the random times tau i are independent or they can be correlated. Perfect. Yeah, this is um, an implicit assumption here is that these random uh, times are independent. In the paper, I consider also um, I relax this assumption and I consider um, affiliated uh, random uh, times, uh, and some of the results will hold uh, under uh, that assumption also. Um, but yeah, I want to basically what I want is to uh, discern the effect from um, the complementarities in payoff from the complementarities in information. If these um, random times were correlated, uh, then you will learn something about the difficulty of the other project by working on, on, you will learn something about project B by working on project A. And therefore, there is um, a way in which the projects relate through the information process. I wanted to make this very independent projects in, in, in terms of, of the right. information and only the, the only dependency is through the payoff function that I'm going to So explain. with correlation, you would probably get uh, more incentive to work sequentially, no? Than simultaneously? Precisely because think. of this externality. Like if I work on A, I learn a little bit about B. So I don't need, need to spend mm -hmm. money on B to see if it's difficult or not. Yes. Um, Yes, it will depend also on what. Um, yes, with correlation, if these are positively correlated, right? It means that if you complete one of the projects, the chance that you're going to complete the other project uh, uh, earlier is um, is higher. Actually, yeah. this is the assumption that I'm going to uh, that I use in the paper is the affiliation. Mm -hmm. um, if you have negative affiliation, so when you succeed in one, this is bad news about the other project. Then this will go in the other direction and some of the results will not hold. Okay, thank you. And I also want okay. to ask, how, did it, how does this, uh, this model based on tau i compare to a sort of model based on an underlying stage being good or bad mm -hmm. and there is yeah. a Poisson signal or some other process? Perfect. 
Yeah, that's usually the assumption that in, in many experimentation uh, papers, there is a constant rate of, of, of success, but this rate is unknown in, in, in binary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve that problem too. This is, of course, more general, because if this we have a distribution that is um, first flips a coin, and depending on the outcome of the coin, has an exponential um, completion time, right, With, uh, that has a constant hazard rate, then you would win in that world. So this is, of course, um, much more general. Um, so the first result that I'm going to present is in this general version, and I'm going to show you um, this proposition one that it holds for any distribution, and then I'm going to focus on, um, oh yeah, I forgot to, to say that. Um, yeah, I'm going to present this equivalence result that, uh, that holds for any distribution, and then I'm going to focus on the canonical results that are going to be related to the, that assumption that you, you just said. So there's going to be a binary state. And this binary state is going to basically tell you whether the project is difficult and the, there is a rate of completion that is low, or the, the project is easy and there is a, a high rate of completion. Great. And for that case that I'm going to call the canonical case, I'm going to tell you exactly how the efficient allocation looks like and what the decentralized allocation looks like and how these two compare. And then I'm going to show you the um, general results and extensions. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so payoffs. If the agent stops at some time um, big T, I assume that he gets some um, deterministic payoff that is Q of FT. And we're gonna assume free disposal, meaning that Q is increasing. The more um, completing a project will not harm the agent. So As Francisco, one quick question. Um, the the Q doesn't depend on T, on capital T. So Exactly. So yep. there is no discounting? Um, there is no discounting, yes. Okay. Um, the results will not change if you are discounting um, mm -hmm. here. Right. And I, what I assume as a counterpart is that developing is costly. Right. So you have a flow cost C that the agent pays throughout the developing stage. So it's kind of like discounting, but it's... Um, easier to work with, but I think the, the results are, are the same if you if you have this counting instead of this uh, developing cost or both. Um, so the payoff of the agent that stops at some time T and completed the project ST will be the, the payoff that he derives from the project completion minus the cost of development. So so the, this cost is linear in the time that the agent spent on the on the developing stage. And the agent will maximize his expected payoff. So I'm interested in particular in complementary projects, as I said in the introduction. So I'm going to say that the projects are complements if the function Q is supermodular. So the marginal contribution of completing one, one, one of the projects is increasing in the set of already completed projects. And the, the projects are going to be perfect complements. If there is no intrinsic value in completing project A or project B, the agent needs to complete both of them in order to get something positive. OK, so this is the, the, the model. Um, so let me tell you how this, what strategies I'm going to be focusing on. So in general, strategies are maps from the set of histories to a set of actions. But for this particular problem, it's going to be without loss of optimality to focus on deterministic stationary strategies. And these stationary strategies depend only on the set of projects that were completed so far and on the cumulative attention that was allocated so far. So in particular, they will not depend on the order in which the allocation was allocated, which is, of course, part of the history, but it's not relevant for the continuation of, of, of the game and will not depend on the time at which the projects in S, so the projects were already completed, were actually completed. So it doesn't matter if the first project, let's say you completed project A, if you completed after working on it for 20 minutes or if you work on it for two years. Why? Because of this independence assumption, this is a sunk cost and it doesn't tell you anything about the continuation uh, of, of the game. So a state, I'm gonna call a pair that includes, uh, well, what set of completed projects, uh, what set of projects were completed so far and how uh, much attention was allocated on each of the projects. And we're gonna use uh, little x 
for the for a stationary strategy and this uh, calligraphic x for the set of uh, stationary strategies and and finally without loss of generality we can focus on on strategies in which no resources are wasted that is on strategies that allocate the full attention at each point in time throughout the developing stage and the reason is well in this case it's very easy to see because i assume that the agent pays the cost independently of whether all the attention is allocated or not but even if it was not true this would be the case because there is no um there is no gain for the agent in delaying the allocation of resources. Okay, so I said that the first result was an equivalence result. So I'm, I'm gonna show you that this um, problem of dynamic allocation of attention across these two projects is equivalent to a much simpler problem. But let me first define what the allocation problem is. So we start from a state. So a set of completed projects and a vector of cumulative attention. Well, all the uncertainty in this model is embedded in, in the vector tau, that is how much, a, how much um, resources I need to allocate on each of the projects in order to complete those. So if we fix tau, if we fix the completion amount and we fix the stationary strategy, there's no, um, there's no uncertainty and there is going to be a deterministic remaining time, let's say tau tilde, uh, t tilde, and a deterministic set of completed projects at this stopping time. So the allocation problem is going to be basically to choose the strategy X that maximizes the expected payoff given the initial state. And we're going to call the value of this allocation problem V of the state. Now consider the, the following problem. Um, and I'm going to call this problem the order independent problem. In this problem, the agent cannot review, like in the previous problem, the strategy at every moment. So he cannot condition the strategy on everything that happened so far. Instead, the agent decides in advance how much to, um, how, ma how many resources to pledge to each of the projects. And we'll allocate these pledges um, independently in any order. So for example, the agent decides to allocate two years worth of attention to project A and one year worth of attention to project B, okay? And the key is that he will allocate this pledge independently um, across the two projects. So for example, if he starts working on project A and then works on project B and he succeeds in project B, he still has to keep working on project A until he either succeeds in that project or he reaches the the amount that he pledged. Now, after the pledge is allocated, then the agent, if he succeeds in at least one of the projects, he can make a new pledge, but otherwise he, he has to stop. If he didn't succeed in any of the projects, he stops. So this pro in this problem, the agent is more constrained than in the previous problem, because in the previous problem, again, the agent can, uh, can change his decision to work on a project or not, based on what happened in the other project. And in this project, he, the agent is um, committed to continue on one of the projects until a certain point. So it has to be the case that the value from this uh, order independent problem, B hat, is lower than the value on the allocation problem, B. However, I'm going to show that under uh, the assumption of complementarity of the, of the projects, these two are going to be the same. And I'm going to call X star the optimal pledge for the agent. So how much he wishes to pledge to each of the projects as a function of the initial state. So the proposition one says that if the projects are complements, then B is equivalent to B hat. So it's the same for all, for all initial states. And this is an if and only if uh, result. So this says that if the projects are not complements, so if there is a violation in the supermodularity of the function Q, then there will exist uh, some a family of distributions, Fi, such that the, the two are different for some initial state. Now, this is a, a useful result because it basically reduces the strategy space from a very complicated um, space, right, the set of all possible stationary strategies to just a few parameters, how much to pledge to each of the projects. 
And let me give you a graphical intuition for this result. Uh, so Francisco, he, um, uh, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. I, I, sure. Just, just to understand, um, suppose I make a pledge uh, to like spend a year on uh, project A, and then mm -hmm. before before I use up that year, I have succeeded mm -hmm. uh, in that project. In that project, how mm -hmm. does? But according to your description, it sounds like I should still use yeah. continue to work on A for the until that year is no, reached. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's incorrect. So what I said is that um, the resources should be allocated independently meaning yeah. that you can only condition on what happened on that specific project. But if you succeed in a project, this is not forcing you to keep working on that project uh, until you complete the pledge. You can stop, but only if you succeed in that project. What you cannot do is to, um, for example, stop because you succeeded in the other project. I see, but, but, does it, but, but presumably if I don't stop, I, I want to, I want to, you know, never because mm -hmm. because A has succeeded, so I don't want to work on A anymore, right? Yes. Um, and so I'm a little, I guess, I guess it would be helpful to have sort of a, a little more formal definition of uh, the order independent strategy here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think I intuitively understand. Um, so Francisco, is this pledge, uh, sorry, is this the maximum amount that you're willing to spend or that you will spend in a project? It's the minimum amount that you will- Oh, it's the minimum uh, Well, it's the minimum amount that you will be willing to spend on a project. But if you succeed, you don't have to, um, you don't have to work for that amount. So if you succeed, you, you stop. That, that's fine. I see. What you I cannot see. do is, um, for example, let's consider the case of perfect substitutes, no? So you have two technologies that are substitutes. Now, if you succeed in one of them, you would like to stop working on the other one, right? Because there is no value in working on, on the other one once you, you have one, if these are perfect substitutes. Mm -hmm. So what this is um, not allowing you is to do that, to stop on one because you succeed in the other one. But you can stop if you succeed in that one. That is, that is allowed. And the, the name, the order independent problem is because once you make the allocation on each of the projects independent of each other, then the order in which you work on them is irrelevant. You can start with one and then work on the other one or vice versa, or you can work on them, on them simultaneously, and the order will not, uh, will not affect the final payoff. And I think that will be clear with the, with the graphical intuition that I wanna show. Okay. So here in the horizontal axis, what I have is the amount of attention that was allocated to project A. And on the vertical axis, the amount of attention that was allocated to project B. So if we fix a strategy, this strategy delineates a plan condition on no success. So condition on no success, for example, these blue strategies will start working on project B and then at some point switches to working on project A and then switches back to B and back to A and some point is the stopping point, the, the agent decides to, to abandon this uh, and stop. So, but this is condition on no success. If there is a success, um, then the efficient continuation is gonna take the form of a simple threshold. Why? Because once the agent succeeds in one of the projects, then the remaining of the game is very simple. Is um, you work on the remaining project until the value of um, succeeding that remaining project is, um, is, is not worth, it, until it's not worth it to work uh, on that remaining project anymore. And this takes the form of a simple threshold because of the independence assumption it does not depend on the amount that you allocated on the project that you already succeeded, okay? Now, what is, has to be true for complements is that these thresholds are higher than the stopping point for the efficient strategy. So this stopping point for the efficient strategy has to be in the box that is formed by the two thresholds in the second stage after the first success. Okay, so if we consider a different plan that has the same stopping point, for example, the red one that starts working on project A and then works on project B 
and then go back to working on project A and back to B and stops at the same point that the blue one. What I'm gonna argue is that these two strategies will have the same uh, ex post payoff. So for any realization of the of tau, these two strategies will give the agent the same payoff. So let's start considering, for example, a tau over here. So you require to allocate this amount of resources to project A in order to complete that project. And you require to allocate this amount of resources to project B um, to complete that project. I'm, I'm assuming that you can see my cursor. Yeah, hope yep. at least. Good. Um, so if we use the blue strategy, then the agent starts with project B, then switches to project A. And at this point, the agent will succeed in working on uh, in, with complete project A. So at that point, the agent will change um, and will move to the second stage in which he works on project B until the threshold. And, uh, and here the agent will stop. So the only project that will end up being completed is project A. So he receives the pay of Q of A. And the cost that he has to pay is, well, the cost associated with the time that he spent working on project A, tau A, plus the time that he spent working on project B, which is the maximum amount that he was working, willing to work on project B, given that project A was completed. Now, if you use the red strategy, the payoff is gonna be exactly the same. Why? Because the agent, again, works on project A until he completes that project, and that is the same, um, takes the same time. And then he will work on project B until um, the threshold. So, he works the same on each of the projects. He only completes project A in both cases, and therefore he receives the same final payoff. And the same is true for any, uh, any tau that we can consider. For example, for this tau here, um, the two strategies will, will complete the projects in different orders. So the blue strategy will complete first project B and then project A. And the red strategy will first complete project um, A and then project B. But in the end, both projects will be completed. So the payoff is going to be Q of AB. And the time that the agent spends in total is going to be the same because it does not depend on the order, of course, that the agent uh, used to allocate the, the resources. So, so Francisco, if this tau was in between this, uh, I don't know if I can maybe go a line, if it was like over here. Um, yes. The, the, these plans look different, no? Um, no, no, I, I, let me see. Um, if, uh, if, yeah, if the tau was over here, you think they will be different. But uh, again, in both cases, the agent will complete both um, projects. Oh, okay, right. So, you would switch, but then you would complete yeah. A anyways. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's the reason that all the, the order in which the agent allocates resources before um, the stopping point is going to be relevant. Um, but uh, but the, this stopping point is going to be all that matters uh, for, for in terms of payoff, and this is what I call the pledge in the in the order independent problem, is how much the agent is willing to allocate to each of the projects uh, before there is a success. That will be the the pledge. Francisco, so what? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question uh, very quickly? Of course. So basically, you're you're assuming that um, in a way enjoying the product of the two projects begins at some mm -hmm. point later in the future. There's no flow utility of the, say A being completed and we get the returns from A while waiting for B to be completed. It's just that in a exactly. way, right? Which is, which is you know, um, mm -hmm. I mean, when exactly. you think about vaccinations, cures and things like that, um, these are truly you can't begin one without the other, basically. In a sense, it makes sense for me for perfect complements. I'm not sure mm -hmm. it makes sense for imperfect. Well, well, yes, that's a good point. And yes, with with perfect complements, there is really no distinction between these two models. When you have a flow benefit uh, throughout the development development stage two, and once where you don't, like in my paper, if perfect complements, these uh, models will be the same. Um, if you have imperfect complements, you're right that it, then the order will matter. Um, 
what I can say is that this will be an extreme case in which the development of these, um, these innovations is a short um, period of time compared to the time in which you will use these innovations, right? So, um, so in the limit, right, this, this will not matter how, how you will, we were able to use innovation A before deciding to stop or complete innovation B uh, will not be relevant for your total payoff. But also that would kind of break the stationarity that we are using, right, to, to, to solve the model. So I, I think it, you know, it's uh, more difficult to solve. Right? Yes, yes, of course. So this is for, for tractability, for sure. Yeah. So basically the original problem treats the red and blue strategies differently. What proposition one shows is that they can be treated like the same. All that matters is how much the agent is willing to work on each project before um, the first success. Um, so I'm gonna say that the, the agent develops uh, the projects in sequence if the solution to the order independent problem, so the optimal pledge is in one of the corners. So for example, here, this means that the agent is only willing to work on project B before uh, the first success and will only work on project A if he succeeds in working on project B. Okay. So now the, let me introduce two more assumptions that will form basically this canonical, um, canonical model. And, and for this, I, I will tell you exactly because it will be easier to interpret uh, these, these, um, these results. Um, I will tell you exactly what the efficient allocation is and what, what the decentralized allocation looks like. So the first assumption is perfect complement. So I'm going to assume that there is no intrinsic value in solving project A or project B. You need to complete both in order to get some payoff. And to save on notation, I'm going to call this payoff gamma. And the second assumption is uh, that there is going to be, for each of the projects, a constant rate of completion. And for each of the projects, this uh, rate of completion is going to be either high, so the project is going to be easy with a high rate of completion, one plus delta. And this happens with probability PI. Or the project is going to be difficult with a low rate of completion, one minus delta. And this happens with probability one minus PI. OK? And the difficulty of each project is independent, of course, to be consistent with the previous assumption that these uh, tau's were independent. Um, so again, working on a project that's not tell you and being unable to succeed does not tell you anything about the difficulty of the other project. Now with this model that is uh, more uh, typical in the experimentation literature, the more the agent works on a project and is unable to succeed, the more pessimistic he becomes about the difficulty uh, of that specific project. So when the rates of um, completion for each of the projects are known, then the timing of development of this innovation will not affect the payoff. Why? Because there is no learning in this process. So either the agent wants to work on the, on the, on the projects or he, he wants to stop immediately. So the, the only question is whether it's worth to complete the projects or not. And the agent will develop, so will complete the projects if the cost of doing so is smaller than the benefit of doing so. The benefit of doing so is what he receives when he completes both, both projects, which is gamma. And the cost of, or the expected cost of completing the projects is C times the expected cost of completing a project A and the expected cost or the expected time that he uh, has to spend to complete project B. Now, if we have intermediate uh, cost of development, then this is an interesting case because um, it means that um, the agent will <clears throat> will want to work on both projects if he knew that both were easy and would like to not work on both projects if he knew that both were difficult. Otherwise, the problem is going to be uh, trivial even for intermediate uh, beliefs. The only question then is what, what does the agent want to do if he knows that one of the projects is difficult and the other one is easy? So in that case, the agent will develop, again, if the benefit of doing so gamma, if larger than the, the expected cost, and when one of the projects is difficult and the other one is easy, the, the expected cost is uh, this expression over here. 
uh, and we can rearrange um, to get this. Um, the agent wants to develop if, if G, which is um, two times the relative cost of development, of development relative to the benefit of, of, of the development, plus uh, delta, which is a measure of how much uncertainty there is about the, um, the difficulty of the project squared, is less than one. In that case, the agent wants to develop. Um, but I'm not interested in the case where, where the agent knows the rate of success. That is a trivial uh, problem. What I'm interested in is when there is a known rate of success. But it turns out that this G is going to be what determines the nature of the efficient allocation of resources. So what Proposition 2 says is that when the, you have uncertain rates, if G is greater than 1, then it's efficient to develop the projects in sequence. Uh, and moreover, the agent will start working on the least promising project. And the least promising project is the one that he believes has less chance to be uh, easy. So it's more likely to be difficult. If G is less than one, then it's efficient to pledge more attention to the most promising project. So the agent will be willing to work more on the more promising project. That is, he will yeah, the difference between the amount that he pledges and the, the amount that he already uh, allocated is going to be larger uh, for, the, for the project with the highest uh, probability of being um, easy. So this is easier to see in belief space. So here on the horizontal axis, I have the probability uh, of project A being easy. And on the vertical axis, the probability of project B being easy. And first, let me show you how the solution looks like when G is greater than one. So remember that from the definition of G greater than one, this is when the agent does not want to develop if one of the project is uh, easy and the other one is difficult. So if we're on one of these corners when one of the projects is known to be easy and the other one is known to be difficult, then the agent does not want to develop. So in red, I'm going to draw the, the boundary, the stopping boundary. That is, th those are the beliefs at which the agent is indifferent between, or uh, the beliefs at which the agent would like to stop actually. So remember that if both projects are known to be difficult, the agent wants to, to stop. And in this case, with G is greater than one, then also the agent likes to stop in this corner. So this is the boundary of the set of beliefs for which the agent would like to stop immediately. So what the proposition two says is that when G is greater than one, it's sufficient to concentrate all the attention on the least promising project. So if we, if we start from some beliefs, let's say here, above the 45 degree line, then the agent will only work on the least promising project, which in this case is project um, A. So as the agent works on that project, he becomes more pessimistic about uh, that project being, um, if, and if he's unable to succeed, he becomes more pessimistic about the difficulty of that project until at some point at which he uh, reaches this boundary and he stops. If we start from a point below the 45 degree line, then the opposite is true. Project B is the least promising one. So the agent will only, um, will concentrate all his attention on that project and work on that project until, until the boundary at which uh, he stops. Um, when G is less than one, then these corners are above the stopping boundary, then the solution is different. We have here the intersection between the 45 degree line and the stopping boundary. If we start from a point like here, which is not to the northeast of the intersection, then the agent will only work on the most promising project. So the agent, again, works on the projects in sequence, but now starting from the most promising one, not from the least promising one. And the same is true um, here, where the agent works also only on the most promising project, but here the most promising project is project A. Now, if we start in a point that is to the northeast of the intersection, then the agent will work on both projects before stopping. And uh, this 
Using the previous result, proposition one, we know that uh, the order in which the agent works on the process will be actually not payoff relevant. So it could be that the agent works first on project A until this point, and then on project B until the intersection, or works first on project B, and then let's say goes on the on this 45 degree line. So works on both projects with the same attention until the intersection. And, and here the, the agent stops. So there is not gonna be a unique solution. The solution is gonna basically all um, paths that lead the agent to stop at this intersection will be efficient. And let me what try happens, to even... Mm -hmm. What happens when uh, G is one? It, it, it feels to me that there's a, a discontinuity, but maybe I'm just missing something. Let me think for one second. So when G is one, um, Yes, when, when G is one, any of the two orders will give the agent the same payoff. So the agent can work on the projects um, in sequence, so first, let me say something. In this case, the agent um, here can, in principle, work on the projects um, on project A first and then on project B or vice versa. So it looks like he's working in sequence, but what, what we define as working in sequence is working on uh, how much he's willing to work on each project that the um, before stopping. Mm -hmm. So let me think what happens when G is equal to one. So first, this corner would be exactly at the boundary. Um, I guess what's interesting um, is that the, yeah. in the Northwest corner of mm -hmm. this intersection point, which is your PX, uh, on the PX, the, the top left one, right? Yes, Here, yes. This, this point when G is uh, in the previous case, uh, in the previous graph, this one mm -hmm. would go, you should, you should uh, go to the right, right? You should work on the least promising one yes. uh, from this point because it's above the stopping mm -hmm. boundary. Uh, but, but, but then- But in the yeah. other, on the flip side, you should, so, so, so I guess there, it somehow has to has to becoming different. Um, yeah, there is no discontinuity. The agent will be indifferent in that case between working on uh, yeah on project um, A first and project B first. Okay. Yeah. So the intuition is that when <clears throat> when G is greater than one, okay. This means again that having one difficult project is sufficient to stop, right? Because the agent does not want to work if there is one difficult project. So the relevant state for this uh, case is whether both projects are easy or at least one of them is difficult. So the most efficient way to learn about this state is to concentrate the resources in one of the projects and learn a lot about one project. And this is how you learn fast about whether both projects are easy or not. And therefore, well, projects end up being developed in sequence. On the other side, when, when G is less than one, they mean having one difficult project is not gonna be sufficient bad news that the agent would like to stop the development of, of these innovations. So the relevant state for that case is whether both projects are difficult or not, and the most efficient way to learn about this, well, if you start from a, from a prior that is sufficient symmetric is to, to, to learn about both, um, both projects before stopping. So you can also interpret this G as the value of complementarity, no? Because if G, if I remember, is um, something divided by gamma. Um, See, yeah. Let me put it here. Two so C know, divided by gamma. Yeah. If gamma is low, that means mm -hmm. the value of the bundle is low. 
then yep. G is larger than one. If G is, if gamma is large, that mm -hmm. number could be less than one. So here you're saying that if there is not a lot of complementarity, where in the case G larger than one, you want to start with the more difficult project. And if the value of complementarity is really large, that's the case G less than one. Um, so here you're all, always in the case of perfect complements. So G, I don't, wouldn't see gamma as the value of complementarities because it's the value, yeah, it's the value of the joint project, if you yes. will. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I would, yeah, take this expression here, C over gamma to say, okay, if the cost of development is large, um, if the cost of development is large, um, then you only want to work on these projects if both are going to be easy. Because if not, if one of them is difficult, this will add a lot of cost and it's not going to be worth the, the investment. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, the optimal way to, to work on these innovations is the, 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 basically the most efficient way to, to learn about whether both projects are easy or not. And the way to learn about whether both projects are easy or not is to concentrate resources in one project and learn a lot about one of the projects. And this is what the proposition two is saying. So you learn about, about one of the projects. If this project does not fail, then great. You succeed and you move to the next one. But if this project fails after some time, then you, you quit, you abandon this, this project. Uh, Francisco, we have about 10 minutes. Perfect. So let me uh, skip the proof. Uh, let me just say that the, yeah, this proof um, works both for, um, for continuous time, but also for discrete time. So I have a, a version of the proof, proof that also, um, that is in discrete time. And let me quickly tell you about the decentralized allocation, what happens in there. So <clears throat> um, I consider a decentralized allocation in a reduced form approach. So basically I say that the decentralized allocation allocates resources all the time to the, to the project that has um, um, highest immediate expected rewards. So here, this is the immediate expected reward of uh, some strategy at some point. Um, here you have the hazard rate uh, of that project, given the amount of resources that you allocated. This is the subjective hazard rate, uh, multiplying the reward if you complete that project. And the reward will again fully capture the immediate value of the innovation and will only capture a proportion alpha of the potential value of, of the innovations. Um, so, and then of course you subtract the cost of development. And this is the decentralized allocation. So for the case of perfect complements, uh, let's uh, to keep it uh, simple, then this uh, reward is going to be just the uh, when when no um, project was already completed, it's going to be just the proportion of the total value of the innovation that is captured um, after the first one is succeeded. So this uh, B is the value when you completed already project I and you allocated the, the this attention X. And um, okay, let me define, I had to define this um, B function that is the value when only project I is left. So the value when only project I is left only depends on the attention that the agent allocated to that project I and not on the attention that the agent allocated to project J. So this BI of XI is equal to the value of already completed project J given that you allocated attention XI. And let's define the subjective completion rate HI. And this subjective completion rate because the agent does not know the, the completion rate of the project, but he can take the weighted average of the two potential uh, completion rates, uh, one plus delta and one minus delta, using the beliefs um, as the weights, of course. Now, these two functions, H and B, are going to be decreasing because the more the agent allocates on one project, the less likely he thinks he will succeed in the next instance, so the lower H. And this will affect, of course, the value of, of the, the continuation value of that, um, of that project. Um, so for the case of perfect complements, <clears throat> then the reward is gonna be the proportion of the value that the 
first agent to succeed gets to uh, have. So the agent is going to, the, the, this decentralized allocation will allocate the attention to the one with highest immediate expected reward. So you multiply the hazard rate of, of project A times the value of succeeding on project A, which is alpha times the value of having only project B left minus the cost of development. Now rearranging this expression, we can see that for any level of alpha level of appropriability, the, the decentralized allocation allocates resources to the project with highest hazard to value ratio. And this hazard to value ratio is also what determines the efficient allocation. So what I didn't say before is that um, when the when the sorry when the when g is greater than one, then the hazard to value ratio is increasing, and when g is less than one, then the hazard to value ratio is going to be decreasing. So what proposition three shows is that the decentralized allocation will be efficient in this case, if and only if alpha is equal to one. So with perfect appropriability, alpha equal to one, the, the first agent to succeed um, is able to capture all the value from the subsequent innovation. And uh, this is good in terms of the first of the inefficiencies that I discussed in the introduction. Because if alpha is less than one, then uh, the decentralized allocation will stop inefficiently early. So there's going to be underinvestment in this innovation because the agent will not capture all the rents from the innovation. With FA is equal to one, then the stopping decision is efficient. But in principle, it could be that the allocation of the resources, so the timing of the innovation will be inefficient. What I show is that this is not the case. Um, when G is greater than one, then the hazard to value ratio is going to be increasing in the resources that are allocated to that specific project. But because um, the beliefs are decreasing the amount of resources allocated to a project, then it means that the hazard to value ratio is decreasing in the beliefs of the agent. So the project with highest hazard to value ratio is the least promising one, what means that the decentralized allocation always allocates resources to the least promising project. But this is exactly what the efficient allocation looks like. When G is less than one, then the hazard to value ratio is decreasing in the amount of resources that are allocated um, to, to each of the projects. But again, because the beliefs are decreasing, then this means that the hazard to value ratio is increasing in beliefs. But, or the project with the highest hazard to value ratio is the most promising one. So this is what the decentralized allocation looks like in this case. So when G is greater than one, the decentralized allocation always works on the least promising project. And when G is less than one, the decentralized allocation always works on the most promising project, which is consistent with the solution that we found earlier in proposition two. So this means that in uh, all these cases, when, when, when alpha is equal to one, then the decentralized allocation is efficient and we can achieve efficiency with uh, by doing this. So, but this is not, um, this is for this specific canonical case. So one question is what happens when you um, when you basically look at the more general uh, problem? So let me tell you about the general results and extensions. So first consider a canonical version with different supports. So in the canonical version that I presented, when the projects are difficult, they have the same uh, rate of uh, success. And they was, when the projects are easy, they also have the same rate of success, one plus delta. But what happens if the rate of success is different for different projects when they are easy and they're difficult? For, for that case, I have a proposition that shows, well, now you have an index for, for each of the projects, GI. And then show that when GI is greater than one for both projects, then it's efficient to work on the new sequence. And when GI is less than one for both projects, then the decentralized allocation uh, is efficient uh, for a perfect uh, appropriability level. Now, when the supports are unequal, it could be that there are inefficiencies, even when the, when the probability is perfect. And for this, I explore one case in which one of the projects has a constant rate of success, lambda A, equal to one. 
And the other project has a rate of success that depends on the state. So for that case, it's always efficient to start uh, by working on the project with uh, uncertain rates of success because it's the only project for which the agent can learn something by working on that project. Um, I can show in that case that the decentralized allocation will be inefficient if and only if the rate of, comp uh, of success for the uncertain project when it's high, so when that, that project is relatively easy, is more difficult than the, than the project for, for which the rate of success is known. And the beliefs about the project of uncertain rate um, being easy is uh, sufficiently large. So the agent is sufficiently optimistic about the, the project with uncertain rate. So this again for, for a case um, when you have a canonical um, problem. So there are these binary states for each of the project, but there are different supports in the rate of success. Um, beyond that, proposition one can still be used to obtain a solution for any function Q that is supermodular and any family of functions uh, of distribution functions FI using standard optimization techniques. And this proposition one can be easily uh, generalized to discrete time and uh, situations where you have asymmetric and um, non-constant flow cost of development. So, so far I assume that you have this constant flow of development, but this was actually not, not required for proposition one. Um, now, if you want to extend these results to more than two projects, then I have um, a result that says that it, as long as you have the monotonicity in the solution, meaning that every time that the agent succeeds in one project, he wants to work more on the remaining ones, you will have this equivalence in proposition one. However, for with more than two projects, the supermodularity of the function Q is not going to be sufficient to guarantee this monotonicity. It could be that the agent wants to, uh, once he succeeds in one of the, of the projects, he wants to work less on the remaining ones, even though the function Q is supermodular. And actually, I have a counterexample in the paper in which this is exactly what happens, and therefore the, the equivalence fails. So what I'm working now on proving is a strong, uh, basically what condition is sufficient to guarantee this monotonicity in the, in the solution. Uh, of course, you need something stronger than supermodularity. And uh, my conjecture is that log supermodularity will work, but I, I don't have the proof yet. Proposition two, on the other hand, uh, only uses the commonotonicity of the hazard to value ratio. So if you give me a, a hazard function right, or a distribution function with a hazard rate, uh, such that the hazard to value ratio is, um, for each of the projects is commonotonic, then I can tell you something about the, the solution. Uh, you don't need all the structure that, that I had in this, um, in this, um, Canonical, um, canonical version of the model. Um, moreover, I can show that the decentralized allocation will be efficient uh, for alpha equal to one whenever the hazard to value ratio is decreasing for both projects or increasing for both projects and there is no intersection in, this, uh, in these two functions. And um, if I have a minute, see. Well, um, a minute. Okay, uh, no, then, uh, then I'm gonna skip it and I'm gonna jump to the conclusion. The conclusion, let's say that the innovation is one of the key determinants of long-term economic growth. And a key insight uh, from the literature on sequential innovation is that if you, want, um, if you want to generate innovation, you should um, reward early innovators for the value of subsequent complementary innovations. What this paper shows is that under some conditions doing so rewarding these early innovators for the, for, the, for the subsequent complementary innovations is efficient, even though the timing of development, development is endogenous. And this could be achieved, for example, by giving the first developer a research exclusivity over the second project that they could license to other developments. They don't need to exercise this research exclusivity. They could, in principle, license it. And in that way, they would capture more rents in, in, in the, the innovation, the, the allocation of resources would be more efficient. Okay, that was uh, that was it. Thank you.
thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you, Francesco, for a great talk. Uh, the panelists for 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 in injecting their comments and and the, uh, the plan right now is we go to a Q and A session. Uh, we will uh, finish officially quarter past the hour. Uh, but after that, we can we can continue uh, discussing informally and not recorded. Uh, so um, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question directly. Um, um, I will ask uh, our panelists whether they have uh, any any last uh, last comments or questions. So I, I just want to say that yeah, Francisco did a good job uh, presenting. And um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting result because the problem is it's quite difficult. And this method that you're presenting, reducing the problem to this uh, order independent problem is uh, probably can be used for other applications. Uh, so it would be interesting to think of, you know, not only on innovation, but um, perhaps other applications that can exploit this uh, structure of the, of the game. Thank you. Uh, you have a question? Yes, Francesco, uh, go on. Question. Uh, Francesco, sorry. Uh, Angel, go on. I don't know who, who, who was. Yeah, first. no, that was me. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely, sure. go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, first of all, I apologize. I was five minutes late, so I'm not sure. I don't know if you already said that. But I think you may, I think that the case of complements is very natural for process innovations. Uh, if you want to sell a new product, very often you have to, uh, it's not just enough, one innovation is not just enough. You have several steps in the building of a new pro product, uh, and all of them are process innovations. And in that case, perfect complementarity may be the, rest, the right assumption. And it is also true that you wouldn't uh, uh, get any payoff uh, until uh, all the innovations are completed. Right, when you launch the product or something. Right, so process innovation, I think, is the best application of your paper. Okay, thank you. I mean, it, it is famous, the case of vaccines is a famous case where there are several steps that needed to be innovated, but it may not be the best example for your model because there, uh, the biggest hurdle very often is the experimentation phase, which is development rather than research. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can find better examples out there. I mean, a new innovation, a new product requires several new process innovations. Until you've done all of them, you cannot do anything. Yes. Um, of course, what is important also in my model is that these are independent in the sense that there is no exogenous order in which you should complete those. For example, if, if in the vaccine case you have different, like, I don't know. Trial uh, in the, in the, stages in the that would not work. Man. What, I, think they, I think there are something like seven or nine steps to for mm -hmm. the messenger RNA vaccines. They're very different innovations. Like writing the RNA code is very different from embedding the final RNA into the mm -hmm. lipidic uh, particles. So, in principle, these innovations originated in different contexts and in different times. So, right. but the problem is that there is the problem is a different one. The problem is that in the end of the day, the, I mean, where all the money is spent is experimentation phase, because you have these medical trials that are super expensive. But I encourage you to find examples elsewhere. There should be plenty. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, have you had a question? This is not really well. It's a clarification more than a question, mm -hmm. and. and I mean, uh, I mean, it goes to the the main contribution or the main uh, message of the paper. No, I, I didn't quite get. I mean, what was the model of decentralization? In particular, I didn't get what were the objective functions of the. Uh, so, how many decentralized agents are? It's only one, two. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that detail. Mm -hmm. In particular, what I was unable, I am unable to understand is what's going on when we have perfect complements and alpha is equal to one. So is there two innovators and then the second innovator? What's the objective function for the second innovator? Perfect. Yeah, so I didn't, in, I didn't want to get into this, uh, this problem of the, determining what the players were and, and all in. Um, I, I think this will add a lot of value of the paper, having like 
a model where you have a, like a finite number of agents and these agents are competing in a model and, and, and look at the equilibrium of that. What I presented is a reduced form of that problem in which the agents, uh, there are no agents. So I define the decentralized allocation and that, that always allocates resources to the project with highest immediate expected reward. So there is a reward of co for completing a project at each point in time that is a function of the state. And there is a probability of success uh, that is also a function of the state. Uh, and what this decentralized allocation, if you want, is like a myopic allocation that always look at the project with highest immediate expected reward and allocate resources to that to that project. Okay, um, I think I now get it. Yes. So okay. So I see this as the as the equilibrium. Uh, what would be the equilibrium outcome if you had like a large number of players? Because these players will be myopic. They will not look at uh, what what happens if I'm the second developer. Um, because they don't think that there's a high chance of being the second developer, so they would be act as if they were myopic. Um, so that's what the decentralized allocation uh, looks like, and what I compare with the efficient allocation. But I don't have a, I don't model this explicitly. The, but I mean, even if I take your story seriously, what happens is that if alpha is equal to one and, and you have perfect complements, I mean, there mm -hmm. are no incentives to put any effort once the first discovery has been produced. In your model, since you know it's costless, because basically you're given with a budget that you have to spend in any case, that's the reason why even this, if the second, if the second mm -hmm. player, uh, if I mean, there's no second player, no, but this fictitious yeah. second player comes into play. I mean, why he's willing to put mm -hmm. his effort, but that sounds a little bit, I don't know, difficult to, to rush. Uh, you know? I see, I understand your question. You're saying, um, suppose that alpha is equal to one, then the first player that de develops one of these innovation will be the only agent in the economy with incentives to complete the second one. And that's exactly. fine. Um, so that's what I said. I don't discuss how you okay, implement something it. like alpha equal to one, but if you give a super patent to the first agent, then, then he could license to other players. Then it okay, will work. It will be a way in which he will capture all the rent because if there are many players, you will make them compete for the development of the second innovation, but you will basically have all the bargaining power and, and capture all the rents because you have this research exclusivity. So oh, I, I don't this, I, again, they didn't have time to discuss explicitly how one would implement something mm -hmm. like alpha equal to one, but one way would be the super patent. Oh, yeah. I see, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Angel. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, um, well, it's um, almost quarter past uh, the hour. So why don't we, uh, why don't we just uh, stop recording and, and close the, uh, the official part of this presentation. So thank you, Francisco, Frank, uh, thank, you, thank you, Jorge and Xiao Seng. Um, and the audience for participation and uh, yes, and now